what are we going to do to provide food, water, and energy to two billion more people in addition to what we have now, and we're not doing a very good job of providing food, water, and energy to the seven billion that we have here. So that is a challenge in and of itself without overlaying the fact that not only do we have that situation, but we have that situation in the context of global climate change. Even without climate change, even without the forcing of climate, it would still be a challenge to provide food, water, and energy to two billion other people. But with climate change, that challenge is amplified, it is magnified, because that is what climate change does. It actually magnifies, accelerates, um, and, um, and um, it, it, magnifies and accelerates the nexus between water, energy, and food. So one way of looking at climate change is, well, in order to address climate change, what we have to do is to build a very complex framework, the purpose of which is going to be to facilitate and accelerate actions at all different levels of governance plus provide a platform for major private sector investment in the right direction. And that is absolutely true, and that's my day job, so we can talk about that later if you want. But tonight, I wanted to pose a completely different aspect. And I wanted to posit to you that uh, climate change is ultimately a choice. And it is a choice because the future that we're going to have tomorrow depends on every single decision and every single choice that we are making today. And we basically have two different tomorrows. So let's look at these two different tomorrows, okay? The first choice. The first choice is basically business as usual. Everybody continues doing what we have been doing. Now, the danger with that is it doesn't seem like a choice because, you know, you're just doing the same thing that you're doing, so you don't have to really choose. But the fact is that it is a choice by default. And it is a pretty dangerous choice because even though it's business as usual, it leads to very unusual circumstances. For example, it would lead to four degrees centigrade, four degrees um, centigrade, which is seven degrees Fahrenheit increase, average temperature rise, average temperature rise around the world. Um, and I say average because some areas would actually reach 16 degrees uh, temperature rise. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, some areas in the tropics. And just so that we don't, so that we know it's not so far away, Southwest United States, I will have you know that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has created a misery index. This is not a term that I am inventing. This is something that the Climate Change Center at the U.S. Department of Agriculture has created, the misery index, which is a combination of heat and temperature. And they have already projected that Southwest United States will have an exponential increase in number of days over 100 degrees, with the effect that a lot of the cattle and animals will be dying, and of course with the effect that we already saw last year of uh, severely reduced harvesting and uh, harvesting potential and crops. So it's not very far away. San Francisco, well, the California Climate Change Center projects that if we continue on business as usual, that choice, it is a conscious choice, has to be a conscious choice, that if we do that, San Francisco could be anywhere between two and a half to four and a half feet higher sea level, which means that there would be flooding threat for a quarter million people, not to mention the levees that are currently trying to protect Silicon Valley. So, point here is nobody is immune to the challenges of climate change. Uh, and the latest uh, study that I've seen says that 80% of the U.S. population is already today affected by some kind of climate change. 80% of the U.S. population. So that's one scenario. And 
please do not think about that as simply not doing anything business as usual. It has got to be a choice. If that is where we're heading, then we have to say that is where we're heading and we have to figure out how we're going to survive that. But we can't just blindly walk into that kind of a future. Okay, that's one. Now, the second choice that we have available to us. Well, that's a very different choice because that is a choice that looks at transforming this world to not only make it very inhabitable, but to actually make it very exciting, extremely exciting. And it is a world that depends on investment, depends on innovation, depends on enterprise. And fortunately, I must say, we're already seeing the beginnings of that. So let me take the energy sector to begin with. Did you know that the United States last year, 2012, installed 13 gigawatts of new wind power? 13 gigawatts. Did you know that the United States installed 3.3 gigawatts of solar, which is more in that one year than the cumulative solar installations that they had had in the three years before that? Which means, put that together, the wind and the solar, that means that 49% of all of the new gener uh, energy generation that was installed in the United States last year was renewable clean energy, 49%. Is that the United States that you recognize? That's what the US is doing. The press doesn't carry that news because it's not bad news, but that's what the US is doing. Did you know that uh, the United Arab Emirates being right in the center of the Gulf states being the major gas producer among those countries, just inaugurated the biggest concentrated solar power plant in the world, 100 megawatts. Why are they doing that? Not because they're running out of fossil fuels, but because they know that that is the technology of the future, and they want to continue to be competitive. So they're investing in the technologies of the future. Did you know, I just returned from the Pacific, did you know that there are several islands in the Pacific that are already fully renewable for their energy generation, and many more on the way to do so, for the simple reason that they don't want to continue to do like Cook Islands is doing, 30% of their GDP dedicated to the import of fossil fuels. Now, how dumb is that when you have the sun over you for 365.2 uh, days a, a year? Doesn't make any sense. So there is already extraordinary transformation happening in the energy sector. But what I've told you are just examples of what I would call incremental change, okay? Those are changes that we're making just because it makes sense. But now consider a world transformed in the energy sector. So consider that every single surface that we have can be transformed into a little mini energy generation plant. Fully possible. Consider that all the waste that we produce, you know how much waste you produce at home, you know how much waste the United States produces, every country, right? Consider that all the waste that we produce could either be fully recycled, and that which is not fully recycled would be fully transformed into energy. And we would not have waste. Fully possible. That is a transformed world.